someone once said that self-control is the capacity to break a chocolate bar into four pieces with your bare hands and then just eat one of those pieces. Now, as you can see by my expanding waistline, it can't be done. And yet we all learn and yearn for self-control. I know I do. We have been on a long journey examining each of the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And self-control is the last of the three fruits which reflects the Christian believer's attitude with himself or herself. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And so today we talk about self-control. Self-control is the one fruit of the Spirit that we all long for, yet few of us can attain. In fact, most people do not even try because they don't want to say no to themselves. Self-control, while it's highly respected and, and greatly desired, is tough. During his term as President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson was somewhat overweight. And one day, his wife, Lady Bird, challenged him with this blunt assertion. Lyndon, you can't run the country if you can't run yourself. And respecting Mrs. Johnson's wishes, the President quickly lost 23 pounds. You see, we all have a problem with self-control. Rather than wait until we can afford something, we pull out the credit card and we buy it too soon. Rather than wait for further instructions, we move forward in our own wisdom, thinking we'll be the boss, only to discover the plans had been changed. Rather than wait on God to fulfill his promise, we decide God needs a little of our help. So we take action and we create a mess. That is just what happened to Abraham. He and Sarah waited for the promised son from God, but each month nothing happened. And finally, after many years, Sarah came up with a plan. She gave her maid, Hagar, to her husband and told him to have a son through Hagar. Abraham agreed, and Ishmael was born. And God said, no, Ishmael is not the promised son. And about 10 years later, Isaac was born. And because Abraham and Sarah didn't exercise self-control, havoc was created. Their result of the inability to wait on God created a sibling rivalry that escalated to hatred and war that continues to this day in the Middle East. You see, the Arab nations are descendants of Ishmael. Granted, our times of not controlling ourselves may not create problems that big. However, the problems that we do create wreak havoc in our lives and in the lives of those who are most close to us. We all need the Holy Spirit's fruit of self-control to grow within us. Well, more about that in a minute, but first, would you pray with me, please? Lord God, so many times we want what we want and we want it now. We don't exercise self-control with our passions and our lusts. And Lord God, usually that gets us into problems. And so, Lord God, today, help us to hear what you would have us hear about self-control, one of the fruits of the Spirit. And help us, Lord, to learn and to be in self-control. And now, Lord God, take these words of mine, mold them, shape them any way you wish, so they become your words both for our hearing and our doing. And all this I pray in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I heard a story about a stunt pilot who was selling rides in a single-engine airplane. And one day he got into an argument with a pastor who insisted on taking his wife along 
at no extra charge. He must have been Scottish like me. Not wanting to miss out on a chance to make some cash, the pilot said, I'll take you both up for the price of one if you promise me not to utter a sound the entire flight. If you make any noise, the price is doubled. Well, the deal was made, and they climbed aboard the plane. Now, the pilot quickly proceeded to put the plane through all sorts of stunts and maneuvers designed to make the bravest person tremble. But the passengers didn't make a sound. Exhausted, the pilot finally landed. And as the pastor climbed out, the pilot said, I made moves up there that that frightened even me, and yet you never said a word. You must have incredible self-control. Well, the pastor thanked the pilot and then said, I must admit that there was one time when you almost had me. Well, when was that? asked the pilot. And the man replied, when my wife fell out of the plane. You see, each of the different characteristics of the fruit of the Spirit focuses on how we respond to God and how we treat other people. But self-control seems to focus more on each of us instead of our relationships with other people. You see, I I can exercise self-control even when no one else is around. In fact, that is the time when each of us actually needs most to exercise self-control. Well, the Greek philosopher Aristotle once said, I count him braver who overcomes his desires than him who conquers his enemies. For the hardest victory is victory over self. And his teacher Plato believed that our animal urges must be governed or else they will produce a feverish state in the soul, a city of pigs, which knows no limits. Think about it. When we're not self-controlled, our life can be like a pigsty. That's quite a word picture that these philosophers painted. Self-control comes from the Greek word for strength, and, and it means one who holds himself or herself in. To be self-controlled is not to live in bondage to the desires and passions and appetites of the flesh. My body can be a good servant, but it really is a terrible master. And so herein lies the problem. It's hard for us to control ourselves simply through our own willpower or self-determination. Self-control is more than just self-help. It requires an inner master. Paul said this in Romans 7, I know that nothing good lives in me that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And so Peter, in our scripture today, says this, Therefore prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. In this scripture, Peter gives us our written marching orders for being self-controlled. First, he says what? Prepare your minds for action. Now, the New King James Version says, gird up the loins of your mind. Now, this word picture is taken from the ancient practice of gathering up one's robes so that you're able to move in a hurry without tripping. Well, here Peter is saying that all of our thought processes need to be carefully focused on God's future grace. We need to gather our thoughts so that our minds are alert and sober to the knowledge of God, who will direct then our purpose here on earth. The idea of picking up one's robes, that is, girding the loins, was so that the garment also would not become soiled. Likewise, our minds are not to become soiled by the pollution in the world or to be hindered by sin and affections and lusts 
of the secular world. Instead, we are to be self-controlled. That is, our minds are to be fixed on the hope of the grace and forgiveness that we receive when we come to the full realization that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. In other words, our focus is to be on Christ. Secondly, Peter says that we are not to be conformed to the evil desires. Or one translation says evil lusts that we had before we came to know Jesus Christ. Being self-controlled means that we are not to submit to the temptations that earlier caused us to lead a life that was apart from God. Many of us know that it is so easy to fall back into that same pattern, the one that we had before we knew Jesus Christ. I find it interesting that in the New Testament, when Paul had the privilege of presenting the gospel to Felix, a Roman governor, he chose to emphasize righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come. Listen to this from Acts 24, verse 25. But as Paul was discussing righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became frightened and said, Go away for the present, and when I find time, I will summon you. Felix was frightened because he had no self-control. He had indulged in all kinds of cruelty and lust, committing both murder and adultery. Felix was no different than many others in the Roman Empire. Scholars tell us that when ancient Rome was disciplined and controlled, it was a great nation But when it became saturated in its own sin, it lost its glory. Drunkenness, orgies, and anything goes mindset caused Rome to cave inward and really to implode upon itself. The decline of the Roman Empire went hand in glove with self-indulgence. Does this story sound familiar? Felix responded to Paul's preaching like many of us do today. Notice what he said. That's enough for now. It's hitting too close to home. You may leave. When I find it convenient, I'll send for you. Well, as you read the story in Acts, you will discover that Felix never did send for Paul again. Paul remained in prison until a new governor came to power. And so I ask you now, to take this self-control inventory of your own lusts. What uncontrolled issues do you deal with? The book of Proverbs addresses these very nicely. The first is uncontrolled lust, Proverbs 6, 26. For the prostitute reduces you to a loaf of bread, and the adulteress prays, upon your very life. Or what about uncontrolled spending? Proverbs 21, 20. In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all he has. Or what about uncontrolled ambition? Proverbs 23, 4. Do not wear yourself out to get rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Or what about uncontrolled drinking? Proverbs 23, 29 through 30. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has strife? Who has complaints? Who has needless bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? Those who linger over wine, who go to sample bowls of mixed wine. Or what about uncontrolled anger? Proverbs 29, 11. A fool gives full vent to his anger, but a wise man keeps himself under control. You know, sometimes I just want to take a pair of scissors to the Bible and cut out all of those passages that may convict me in my everyday living and lusts. Don't you want to do that sometimes? So what lusts are uncontrolled issues for you? 
What do you have to deal with? I'm sure you or your family members know what they are. Uncontrolled self-control means we need to ask God for help. And then let the Holy Spirit work actively in our lives. And so Peter gives us our instructions for self-control. First, Peter says to prepare our minds for action. Secondly, Peter says to not conform to the evil desires or lusts we had before coming to Christ. And thirdly, Peter writes, be holy in all you do. Why? Because God said, be holy because I am holy. The God of Israel and of the Christian church is holy. He sets the standard for morality. Unlike the Roman gods, he is not warlike, adulterous, or spiteful. Unlike the gods of the pagan cultures popular in first century when Peter and Paul lived, God is not bloodthirsty or promiscuous. He is a God of mercy and justice who cares personally for each of us, each one of his followers. Our holy God expects us to imitate him by following his high moral standards. Like him, we we should be merciful and just. Like him, we should sacrifice ourselves for others. The holy life, the godly life, can only come when we study and pray and worship the one true God who we'll talk about next week. Paul wrote this to his friend Titus. It sounds a lot like what Peter wrote in our scripture today. Listen to what he said. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all people. It touches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. God sets our moral standards for self-control. But we need to know what God says, and that can only be found in his word. In our culture today, why do we shy away from the daily reading of the Bible? Don't we want to know God better? Why is it that we succumb to the pressures of this world and and not strive to be more like God and his kingdom? Be holy, Peter says, in all that you do. As we bring this message series to a close, the key to displaying each of the nine fruits of the Spirit is not to try harder, but to understand the short phrase that appears right after the spiritual fruit salad in Galatians 5.23. It says this, Against such things there is no law. This means that these characteristics cannot be legislated or enforced by a set of rules. You can't make somebody be kind or patient or gentle. Likewise, no law can keep us from displaying luscious fruit in our lives. The only thing that is keeping us from allowing God's fruit to ripen in our lives is our own selfishness and sinfulness. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let's allow the Holy Spirit to empower us on a daily basis. We don't have to go up in a plane to seize self-control. We could stay right here on the ground. We don't have to live out our life in a pigsty either. We have plenty of opportunities right where we are to accept Jesus Christ into our hearts and minds and ask the Holy Spirit to do a mighty work within us. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to make his fruits evident in our lives to God, to others, and to ourselves. Praise be to God. Lord God,
Over these past nine weeks, we have looked intimately at each of the fruits of the Spirit. Lord, help us to live those out. But maybe one of the most important is the self-control. Help us not to succumb to the lusts and desires and sinfulness that our bodies so want to do. Lord, help us to be immersed in, in your word. Help us to live our lives out like you showed us in your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to be holy like you are holy. We were created in your image, and so, Lord, within us is the ability to become like you, to polish that image, and to be in self-control. And so now today, God, we call to you for help. Help that the Holy Spirit would work within us so that these nine fruits might be displayed in each of us as we worship you, as we help others, and as that we work from the inside out, from our hearts, to become more holy like you. And all this we ask in your precious Son's name. Amen. I want to thank you for worshiping with us today. As we go through this time of Lent, it's a time of self-reflection. And so look within yourself and how you are demonstrating self-control with your spouse, with your children, with your grandparents, with those who are in your lives and with your relationships with other people. Do you succumb easily to the desires of the flesh and your own sinfulness? And so I challenge you this week and, and throughout the rest of Lent, how have I maintained self-control? Ask yourself, how have I maintained self-control in the situations in which I find myself? And now, may the mercy of God ground us, the love of Christ take root in us, and the Holy Spirit grow in us that we may be ready for the coming of the kingdom. And all the people agreed and said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.